Welcome back to our documentary series on the life and work of Mies van der Rohe. In the last episode, we explored Mies' early works, from his residential projects to his iconic Barcelona pavilion. Today, we'll dive into the next phase of his career, where his architectural genius reached new heights. In this exciting new chapter, you'll discover how Mies challenged architectural conventions of his time, transforming the way we conceive space and structure. Continuing with the conversation, the other hugely important figure in his life during these years was a man named Gilbert Simmer, an urban planner. In 1924, Gilbert Simmer had dreamed of the city like this, and when Mies van der Rohe had to design a city, he completely changed his aesthetic approach. The pavilions, the houses, were made with fragmented forms that dissolved, integrated into the landscape. However, when he had to work in the big city, he used Herbersheimer's ideas. Indeed, during these years, which were politically complex and marked by very few constructions, I saw many projects. In this case, they were not just theoretical, they were competitions. Sometimes he won, other times not, and he never got to build any. It must be said, somewhat melancholically, that even those who won the projects also failed to realize them. In the end, they were always given to someone else who hadn't won. In this case, it was the Adam department stores on Free Street for a large department store owned by a Jewish family. They probably could have built it, but what happened was Crystal knocked the night of broken glass after 1933. The family fled Germany, and the project could not be completed because the owners, being Jewish, had to leave the country hastily. Another one was this, a bank in Stuttgart facing the large railway station that you see there, which always criticized his immaterial architecture. Bonatz had collaborated with the Nazis on the Autobahn program, and he thought that his virile, solid, masculine, and thick architecture was more appropriate for expressing national socialism than Mises' naked and almost diagrammatic one, although suitable, as you can see here, for later being adorned with signs. Something that we now see as normal and that was then an innovation is the use of the facade as a large advertising billboard. Nor did he succeed here in Alexander Place. He proposed something very similar to Gilbert Simmer's vision, large parallel blocks that might seem abominable to some of you, but that's what European cities have been built with after World War II. He couldn't do it here either. The previous winner didn't build it in the end. Instead, it was Bonatz, the author of the station in front, who ended up doing it. Peter Behrens completed this. And this last one, which was a competition on the same triangular plot of land on Friday Strassen, where he had designed the skyscraper with sharp shapes. He presented a proposal that was similar to, of course, when you see this, many of those following our channel will say, ah, this sounds like Mendelssohn. Indeed, it was a tribute to Mendelssohn, to the Mendelssohn who influenced the building with those parallel horizontal bands as a way to express, let's say, the dynamism of the times. He called it Rote Crazy, the Red Circle. It wasn't successful. Mendelssohn won that competition, but it wasn't built either. Mendelssohn couldn't achieve it, or it was done by someone else. So, in the end, many disappointments. And the last one, the saddest, the most dramatic, because it was where he had to steal himself and enter the competition for the rights bank. This was in 1933. Hitler was already chancellor. And this same Mies van der Rohe, who had been president of the November Group, who had erected the monument to Liebknecht in Luxembourg in Berlin, decided to participate in the competition to build the rights bank. For him, under the Nazi regime, it was not successful, but he proposed these rough and austere blocks where he tried to combine the monumentalism of the Nazis with the purified and austere character of the new architecture. It also wasn't successful, and these were years when he truly lived off his work as a professor. In 1930, things took a turn for the worse. 
Gropius had to step down from leading the Bauhaus, and James Meyer, his replacement, was also dismissed. Eventually, the mayor of Dassau called upon Mies and asked him to take charge of the institution. Mies arrived there with his right-hand woman, Lily Reich, and Gilbert Simmer, and tried to govern the house, which was increasingly under pressure due to its leftist perception in the Nazi Germany. The Bauhaus had little chance of survival in the Nazi regime. Mies was chosen because he was renowned for being a refined man who designed for millionaires, not seen as a Bolshevik. They hoped that through him, they could save it. He served as director for three years, but in 1933, one early morning, the Nazis shut down the school. Here you can see Lily Reich and Gilbert Simmer providing explanations to the students on the day of the final closure of the Bauhaus. And Mies, with Lily Reich gazing at him devotedly, entered another stage of what he called the creative pause. This creative pause often frustrated his clients, as things were never delivered on time. He would say, Architect, when will it be ready? And he would reply, I need to think about it more. It's the creative pause. In this case, it was a historic creative pause that lasted almost a decade. He didn't simply enter a creative pause. He was sailing in the Guanze with Lily Reich. He even made one last effort to reconcile with the Nazis. He held an exhibition, the Louise Garbet Exhibition of German Work in 1934 during the Nazi regime, attempting to persuade them to embrace his ideas. He showcased his designs with these glass columns, aiming to convince the Nazis to adopt modern language as their own. Within the Nazi regime, there were diverse tendencies. The most significant was the opposition between Minister Rosenberg, advocating for a populist, neo-traditionalist approach, and Goebbels, the regime's chief propagandist. Hitler himself sometimes supported modern ideas for factories, but insisted on neo-vernacular houses and classical monuments. On the contrary, Goebbels defended a somewhat expressionist line, akin to the style of Nold. This might be surprising now, but at the time the Nazis believed, at least according to Goebbels, that just as Mussolini had adopted futurism, a vanguard ideology and form, as the national art, they could embrace expressionism as the national art of national socialism. However, this vision never materialized. In the power struggle between Goebbels and Minister Rosenberg, Rosenberg emerged victorious in 1937. This victory culminated in the infamous Degenerate Art Exhibition, where many expressionists were labeled as degenerates, marking the end of their influence. Interestingly, this event also represented a defeat for Goebbels, who had tried every means to reach a compromise within the regime. He even went as far as to draw and submit a proposal for the design competition for the German pavilion at the 1934 Brussels World's Fair, attempting to merge his signature style of segregated pillars and walls with a sense of axial monumentality more in line with the regime's preferences these axial axes, and in fact, he even drew up the elevation of the pavilion, not only with the German eagles, but also with the Nazi swastikas, the same architect who had drawn the elevation a few years earlier for the monument to Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht with the sickle and hammer. But it didn't work. He tried, tried to reach a pact in every way. Others tried too, Gropius tried too, but he tried more than others. So later, when Gropius or Moholy Nagy's wife reproached him a lot, when everyone ended up in American exile, because in the end, almost everyone ended up in America, except for some who went to Russia, for example, like James Myers, almost all of them ended up in America. And then the American exile, well, these Germans from exile, some reproached Mize very bitterly for having gone so far in his desire to reconcile with the Nazis to the point of making the Brussels Pavilion. These are extraordinarily unfruitful years. 
He draws a shelter in the mountains which critics attribute to that desire to find peace in the rural world, to get away. He draws this mythical drawing because he always talked about it, where it seems that he invents the raised glass box as the foundation of the new architecture. And he invents something that would be very important, which are the courtyard houses, which everyone interprets as a representation of isolation. The world is so tremendous that I am going to make a courtyard around, and I'm going to take refuge inside my courtyard. He made this courtyard house for the son of E. Lang, one of the two who had seen the brick houses. He had gotten married, so he projected this house as seen surrounded by a courtyard. He drew this house as the courtyard house with a garage. And he did these exercises that he later did with the students at the Bauhaus. And then when he went to America, as he continued to be a professor there in Chicago, he always gave his students the first exercise of the course to make a courtyard house because it's easy. It's a single floor. There's no context. They don't have to think about anything. And it's easy for the students, serving as a gymnastics exercise in the modern language. In all these courtyard houses, they are not even drawn by Mies anymore. They are drawn by his students, first from Berlin's Bauhaus, which moved also, it must be said, from SAO to Berlin, as if it were an appendix of his, and finally from the Arm Institute, which would later become IIT of Chicago. And these houses, as you can see, are three courtyard houses. This is the famous three patio house, which has one, two, and three, and they are organized with an enclosure around. They are still used in schools as an exercise because it is a great exercise to make people think and to familiarize themselves with a language. But in this case, we have to associate it inevitably with Mises' desire for seclusion, consumed by events and swept away by the storms of history. In the end, he goes to the United States, making a first exploratory trip in 1937. They commissioned him a house, the resort house, and it's interesting how they commissioned it because it was Mrs. Resso, who was a patron of the MoMA. The MoMA was a kind of modern city. New York was the center of the avant-garde, where the great American patrons like Rockefeller, etc., invested in having an institution connected with European culture. It was very cosmopolitan, but was divided into two halls. Alfred Barr, the director, tried to commission Mies for the expansion of the MoMA, but he failed. He failed because the Americanists on his board said he shouldn't go beyond this point to make an American. They commissioned it to Philip Goodwin. So what did Alfred Barr do? He convinced Mrs. Resort, who was with him on the board and represented the Cosmopolitan Wing, to take the project away from Goodwin and give it to Mies. And that's what Mrs. Resort did without blinking an eye. She decided that since Goodwin had been commissioned for the MoMA expansion, she would take away the house that Goodwin had started building, a country house like the large mansions that American millionaires build in the countryside, and she commissioned it to Mies van der Rohe. So she dispatched the architect, and in this kind of struggle, she commissioned it to Mies. Mies proposed a house like a nearly perfect box. What he wanted to express with these extraordinary documents is the desire of Mi van der Rohe to reduce architecture to its purest essence. He aspired for architecture to become almost nothing, as subtle as a simple frame that frames and showcases the landscape without adding more than what is strictly necessary. These documents reflect this minimalist and timeless vision of architecture, where simplicity and purity are the key elements. Or this other one, the collage he made to express his project, this is my resort house. He used nothing more than a screen, as you can see, a painting by Klee that he owned, enlarged in scale and then the landscape behind it. Just a frame. The architecture has disappeared, faded away in this first trip. He visited Wright, as was logical. Wright, who didn't receive many people, welcomed him, mainly because he considered him a disciple. He would say, 
I invented this sliding planes and this German has executed it very well. Then they would break off relations. Indeed, the romance didn't last long, but here you have Mies van der Rohe visiting Frank Lloyd Wright at Taliesin, 20 years his senior, who received him warmly and helped him in his early steps in the United States. Although his main support came from people on the East Coast who wanted to take him to New York or Boston, they offered him the deanship at Harvard, and it seemed they were going to give it to him. He already understood that they had offered it to him, and finally, to his great disappointment, the deanship went to Gropius, his arch-rival. Of course, this was terrible for him because he understood, and rightly so, that Gropius was not such a good architect. It's true, he didn't have such a good eye. However, it must be said that he was a better pedagogue. The Bauhaus under Gropius was better than the Bauhaus under Mies. And then, the Harvard under Gropius was better than the IIT Chicago under Mies van der Rohe, where he would eventually teach. Chicago, where Mies eventually ended up because, well, he had this commission for the Ressat House. But when Mies arrived, German was no longer spoken. So the condition he set to go was, but I have to take someone with me to have a small bubble of friendship. And he managed to get them to hire two Bauhauslers, who are the ones you see here, speaking on the streets of Chicago with Mies himself and Mendelssohn. They are Peter Hans, the photographer, and Gilbert Simmer, an old acquaintance, the urbanist. With Peter Hans and Heller Simmer, he managed to create two assistants who were useful for projects and also for teaching, and with whom he could speak German because he took a long time to learn English and never spoke it well. Their first project for the campus, as you can see, was still classical, well, classical in the sense of boxes, but with a certain monumental quality. However, their final project is this, and it's impressive because it's a kind of madness of modulation, 24 feet by 24 feet in plan and 12 feet in elevation, which is very well expressed in this drawing. The whole campus was going to be a series of perfectly modulated pieces that composed it, similar to how the planes divided the space in the Barcelona Pavilion or in the Tugendat House. Here, they were the urban pieces that divided the urban space in the same way, not creating a fluid urban space where the street, the square, the regular conformation disappeared. The space was also going to be urban space, a fluid space. And what Mies did was something extraordinary. By making the buildings of this Lily T campus, he invented the American industrial vernacular. The first one he did, the only one he could do before World War II broke out, was the Look at Metals building. Here, the photographer, a very refined and legendary photographer of that time, also put Mies and Gilbert Simmer to give the scale, which is funny. And he made this building out of nothing but metal profiles, glass, and brick. But the interesting thing is that it was still a Gothic building. The difference between Gothic and classical buildings is that a Gothic building is one that is extroverted. It's a building that's all the same. It's a section that comes here until it finally expresses itself. And this is almost the front. It's almost the section of the building. If you look inside, you can see how these are the three laboratory floors. And this is the large hall where tests and trials were conducted for this technological campus. It was very focused on the theme of the metal industry, which was so important in that area. So it's something that isn't easy for me to explain in a few words, but I'll try to summarize it briefly. He tries to solve the problem of the corner in a way that may seem unworthy. The problem of the classic corner is incredibly challenging, dating back to the era of the Greek temple. Finding a solution to this issue, where the building turns the corner gracefully, is quite complicated. Constructing a building that follows a rhythm is relatively easy, but achieving a seamless transition at the corner where one rhythm merges into another in a reasonable manner is very difficult. The ancient Greeks managed to solve this problem 
but modern architecture made of glass and metal had struggled to do so. That's why, in the first building at Miracles and Metals, Mies also left a Gothic gable, an extroverted building. It's only much later, after nearly 1,000 drawings, that he managed to illuminate the classical gable. The corner. Let me explain it to you better with these drawings. What he did was that the load-bearing element, the column, bent with these two elements, and in the end, something was built that you see here. And one might say, well, it looks simple, but it's the result of an extremely refined intellectual effort. Firstly, to show that it turns, that it's not a strung-out building, but a building that has almost a peripteral condition of a temple, surrounded by columns. And secondly, it's crucial. Notice with what elegance these metal profiles do not reach the ground to express that they do not bear loads, because the loads, sorry, the loads go through here, not through here or here. Thus, we can show that they do not have to be supported on any side, that they could be in the air, that these are a plastic compositional resource, not a tectonic one. That dialogue between the constructive and the aesthetic, which is the essence of architecture. Mies took it to an extraordinary extreme here. I won't bore you, but I want to say that. Mies's career, one starts to see buildings and says, I've already seen this one. I've already seen this one, with his obsession of always doing the same thing like a hedgehog. Now let me tell you, this is the museum for the small city and they say, but we've already seen this one. It's the, no, it's different. Here, he thought of something else. Yes, it looks like the resort house. Yes, but it's not the resort house. These are the two theoretical projects he did during the war when there was no work, nothing could be built. He taught his students, but they couldn't build, not even on campus. There was steel, but nothing could be done. So he made two theoretical projects, expressed in three photo montages, which also changed the course of architecture. This is the museum for a small city with these two... With just these two elements expressing a museum as almost nothing, with elements like the landscape and the carpentry being almost minimal. And then something even more extreme, the auditorium. The auditorium, he thought of it using a photograph that already existed of a factory in Almrium, the same Almrium where they made the Ford factory. You'll remember that we've seen it when Gropius looked to Almrium to make factories in Germany. But in this case, it's a colossal factory with large trusses spanning 300 feet. Why? Because they built flying fortresses there. As you know, even before the U.S. entered the war, Roosevelt was already supplying the British Churchill with planes to defend against the German air power in World War II. This factory where they made the flying fortresses was built. In that factory, he proposed this image of an auditorium that seems like nothing. If you look at where the auditorium is, well, it's just a small slope, an acoustic roof, and some screens. It's hardly anything. In Mises' auditoriums, they are effectively a continuous plane that manages to ensure everyone sees and fosters that communion between the speaker and the audience, avoiding this kind of podium defense. He thought of this here and built it many times later. It's hard to believe that he barely produced anything, and for four years, he only made three collages. During that time, Frank Lloyd Wright would have made 400 drawings, yet Mies only made three, but he thought a lot. One of the things Mies is famous for is standing in front of a model or a drawing and just thinking, maybe for 20 minutes. 20 minutes may seem like a short time, but watching someone for 20 minutes with nothing but contemplation can feel like an eternity, I can assure you. He did this just to judge a proportion, to think about how he could refine an element a little more, always in search of objectivity. Because he wanted not to be a part of anything, he wanted architecture to speak for itself, to have a rational logic, not to be the product of the architect's subjectivity. In 1947, his great advocate, Philip Johnson, organized an exhibition at the MoMA, 
and this exhibition undoubtedly consecrated him in the United States. The exhibition they see here was designed with Mises' ideas in mind, with the same principles of planes around which space flows. This was a very important catalog because, in 1947, it coined the myth of Mies, which would be intimately associated with the Museum of Modern Art in New York from then on. And this is the exhibition where, as you can see from the panels, they even attempted to evoke somewhat illusionistic images of the Barcelona Pavilion or some other projects. And here is Mies, looking at what would be his first house in the United States, the model of the Farnsworth House, which was exhibited in that exposition, examining it carefully. He hadn't built it yet. He had designed it in 1945. The curator of his exhibition, Philip Johnson, who saw the house at the exposition, logically immediately made a glass house, which he finished soon after in 1949, long before Mies could build his glass house. Of course, it's not as good, but in the end, when one says the glass house, it turns out to be Philip Johnson's house. So the disciple stole the idea from the master and built it before him. But the master is here, contemplating which house he will build for Dr. Edith Farnsworth, his lover at the time, a very powerful woman, a wealthy doctor who wanted a house in the countryside, in a flood-prone area. He put it up on stilts and conceived it as an exact, perfect box, supported only by eight pillars, and here you can see it during the construction process. It was construction reduced to its essence, to the most elemental, to barely anything. Two planes and four pillars, eight pillars that create a free space, the house, along with falling water and a few others. These are the houses that our students always study because here a new way of seeing space was crystallized. It must be said that Dr. Farnsworth broke up with him and then also sued him because the house was uninhabitable, because he had done everything wrong, because he had spent more money, and so on. A disaster. But the house is still there. It can be visited in the United States because, fortunately, it was bought by Peter Palumbo, and in the end, it ended up in the hands of the National Trust. Therefore, it is now one of the sites that can be visited in the United States. In this chapter, we delved into the fascinating life and work of renowned architect Mies van der Rohe, from his innovative ideas at the Bauhaus to his impact on modern architecture in the United States. We discovered how his revolutionary designs challenged conventions and laid the groundwork for a new understanding of space and structure. I hope you enjoyed this journey through the mind of one of the great visionaries of 20th century architecture. Don't forget to subscribe for more content on art and design. Until next time.